Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to this month's meeting of the Mono Basin Historical Society. It's another great meeting with some great history about water. But first, I'd like to ask our treasurer if she has an update about the museum and what has been going on. Because the museum has been open and it's been getting a lot of guests. So, Lenora, would you like to? I'll come over to you. Thanks, Dave. Um, so the July report for the museum for the month of July, we had 1,081 visitors, even with the pass closed. Yes. So um, which is actually up a little bit over last year, believe it or not. Um, they donated $791. So that is wonderful. Uh, we had guests from Italy, Spain, and a lot of people escaping the heat in the South. We have people from Texas and LA and everywhere else. Um, we started the month of July with our second annual Indian taco fundraiser. Do you have a picture for us, Rich? Janice Mendez and her family made and served 97 Indian tacos and 25 fry bread. We ate well, we made $600, and we had a great time doing it. There we go. Thank you, Janice, Jarrett, Amber, Austin, and Robin isn't in the picture, but she was there also. Actually, Dave Swisher was there too. <laughs> How can I forget you? Um, on July 12th, the Mono Lake volunteers showed up to pull our weeds. Uh, the, the exhibits look so much better. You know, big winter, we had big weeds. We filled three large trash bags, and we can't say thanks enough to the Mono Lake volunteers. Our student docents have been busy greeting visitors, cataloging our reference library, creating signage for our display cases, arranging oral history interviews, and reading through the binders to identify keywords for our digitization project. Thank you, Alden, Diego, and David. So that's about what's been going on in the museum. We're having a very good summer so far. Thank you, Lenore. You've been doing an outstanding job down there. It's really nice to hear about all the guests that are coming in, donations, which is super. So I'm going to pass it now to Linda LaPierre, our historian, for a brief update. We've been busy in the museum doing some changes. Uh, Jarrett showed up and uh, Bob Marks was there and we took all, they took all the dirt out of the one cabinet and that has been rearranged. Um, we call it our Native American cabinet. So come in and see it, it looks very nice. Uh, I've been doing some cleaning of the other cabinets and we're looking to do naval more labeling and the um, young people that are working there have been helping me do that. Um, so it goes on, come in and see the changes. I, oh, I have that there. Yes. In this new case, the one we took the dirt out of, we have two new baskets. One is a water bottle and they are Mono Lake Paiute bottles bottle and then another small uh, burden basket not burden basket gathering basket that may have been used for seeds and they are now in the case my next my next thing is going to be to label the um, baskets with their native american name and then the english name so that's because we we found a book that has those in it for the mono lake paiutes Thank you, Linda. At this time, I'd like everybody to understand what our goal, one of our goals of the Mono Basin Historical Society is. We acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the unceded traditional land of the Kuzetica people. This came about with great work from Bob Marks in the presentation he gave last month. We want to keep this going. We're going to get this done up on a plaque and put at the museum so every visitor can see and read and understand why we are here. So 
as part of Lenore's uh, back, backing with me, because she's been heading this up, we have a great weekend coming up the end of this month, the 25th and 6th, the Ghost of the Sagebrush. We have dinner Friday night at the Mono Inn. We have a special guest that's going to attend. You've got to go there to see who it's going to be. It's going to be full of history and a great guest. On Saturday, we're going to gather at the park. There's going to be a box lunch ready and another great eventful day going all over this area, learning more history about water. So the tickets are on sale now. I can't believe That's the description of topics for Saturday. Oh. Leroy, Leroy Vining Ranch on Saturday, the Sawmill, the Ranger Station, LADWP Diversion, the Power Company Headquarter Camp, and the Pool Power Plant, which is a great opportunity on Saturday. And like I said, Friday night, we have a special guest showing up. You need to be there to see what he's going to talk about, a very historical person for this area, especially for this town. So the tickets are $35 for dinner Friday night, $30 for the lunch per person. It's a great opportunity. This is one of our biggest fundraisers of the year for the Historical Society. And this really helps us, gives us a boost for the rest of the year. If you'd like tickets, you can go on our website or contact Lenore or one of us, and we'll be glad to get you tickets. Visit the museum. They'll be there all the time. So at this time, well, you're coming up next. I thought you were doing what I was going to talk about. No. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to have Dave come up now and introduce our guest speaker. Can I make one? Oh, we have another announcement here. Wait, there's more. And wait, there's more coming up. And what do we have, Janet? Yeah, um, just while there's a lot of local folks here um, and online uh, on Zoom, uh, there this coming Friday, there's a uh, memorial service for Marty Strelnick was a real um, Mono Basin personality. He was our county sheriff for years. He wrote about fishing and outdoor life and uh, was really made an impact on the county. And there's a, a service uh, at the Presbyterian Church at 10 o'clock on Friday, not Saturday, not Sunday, Friday, <laughs> the 11th. And then there's a big barbecue in Hess Park at one o'clock that same day on Friday. So, um, I'm sure the family would welcome whoever would like to come and pay their respects to Marty. Dave, do you want to mention Friends of Booty Day on Saturday? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, on Saturday, another, another announcement here, is a big day in Bodie, which is just 15 miles up the road. It's called the Friends of Bodie Day from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. The town is open. There's be historical artifacts out, bands playing, we open some of the buildings, there'll be lots of tours, and if you're a foundation member, after the park closes at 6 o'clock, you stay around for a dinner and skits around town, which you must see, because I'm in one of them. So. It's too early yet for the state to be at 6.45. I want to talk a more about the ghost today. We're going to have Dave talk about the ghost event because he is a ghost himself that is, comes alive. Whatever that means. Um, yeah, I, I have been uh, coordinating things for the, this event, and I want to um, answer any questions you might have about what's coming uh, by telling you some of these things that are coming. Today, I was on the phone with the representative who's working with us from Southern California, Edison. And they are, he says, their staff people are excited about all of the history we're going to explore that day. He says they're going to learn a lot, he thinks. Um, but they're also going to do some things for us. When, when we get uh, to the upper end of, of Levining Canyon after doing a number of stops, I'll, I'll go back and explain about earlier. Um, they're going to open the doors to the pool plant. Now, I think we probably won't get to go inside especially not if we're 60 or 80 people, even if it's just a few at a time. But maybe. They, they've they said we have to wear special protective gear if you do. But they're going to open the doors. And I hope that we'll be able to, to make some sense of what, you know, what all that roaring noise is all about. There's a big 
massive Felton wheel in there that is taking water from dropping 1,600 feet from Ellery Lake down and an incredible head and uh, quite a story of history. So the rest of the story is Lee Vining Canyon, um, starting with Mr. Leroy Vining, who had a ranch at the base of Lee Vining Canyon, right about where the junction is today of uh, Highway 120 and 395 and where Lee Vining Creek crosses under the highway in there. That was Leroy's land at one time, or at least he claimed it way back. Now we're talking 1857, 1858, 1860s. He died in 1863. We'll, we'll go into all of this whole story as part of what's happening, both on Friday night and on Saturday. Then we're going to move up Canyon a bit. Um, there uh, is the story of the history of the 1917 establishment of a U.S. Forest Service Ranger Station here, uh, the Levining Ranger Station, where it is today. Um, and how that came about, some interesting stories about when the, by the 1930s, when the CCC came in during the Depression years, um, CCC worked in the Eastern Sierra out of various camps, and they built uh, a compound um, that had been pretty, pretty basic before that. They added a lot of uh, structures and um, buildings and, and uh, residences, and, uh, and it, there's an intriguing story about the, the, trouble that the the ranger the district ranger got in over um, allowing uh, the local people wanted to build a special fireplace for him in his house and it didn't meet government standards and he got in big trouble for that but it's a beautiful rock fireplace so we have stories to tell you and uh, then we're going to move up canyon um a little a little bit uh out of order here in terms of the history is that the next topics basically are all focused on the hydropower story that that ultimately you know, we're going to get up to pool plant but along the way in order to build what uh, got built in for for hydro generation in the canyon um, there was a work camp established called headquarters camp we're going to take you uh we hope uh if, the, if it's not too wet things are drying out finally there we're going to take for you for uh, the group for a little walk through the woods to see where the foundations are of what was once a quite a extensive construction camp um, with houses and uh, work buildings and uh, commissary and all kinds of stuff for the people who built. Now we're talking in the 1920s, uh, especially 1923, 24, things were being coming to some completion. And this is um, uh, earlier up, up Canyon, there's the three reservoirs that were completed, Ellery Lake, Tioga Lake, uh, and Saddlebag Lake to feed the water to, to drop it down to eventually to pool plant. Um, there's another one though, that there's a real in intriguing thing that we've got on the uh, uh, list of where we're going to go and including the DWSP Los Angeles diversion site for Levining Creek. What, there used to be a power plant right where the substation is right here at the end of town. It used to be a hydro power plant that had a, its own small reservoir upstream, um, just about at the downstream from where the ranger station is, about where the PUD has their uh, their their water tanks today. And there's a, a much smaller reservoir, and um, that's part of the story too. And of course, by the time that LA had come in and had gotten the rights to take all of the water out of Lee Vining Creek at the Lee Vining Creek diversion that we'll take you to, um, there was no way to keep running a hydroelectric plant here. So they converted it to what we have today, a substation. So all of these kinds of stories. And, uh, and we'll put it all together for you. We have a bunch of old pictures. Got a little booklet everybody gets every year. We do with the cups of the sagebrush. You get to go home with a nice little um, booklet and uh, with the, a lot of the information and, and the photos that we're going to show you. So, so I'm, I'm also I'm stretching this out because we're supposed to start at 6:45 if that clock is right. And we and if anybody wants a ticket tonight for the ghost event or the dinner, uh, the, the ghost tour on Saturday or the dinner on Friday. You can get those. I'm looking up at the empty chair where Lenore was sitting a minute ago. And, um, and, and or you can go right on to our website, which is mobilizinghistory.org. Um, 
and you can you can do it right there. I I did mine today. It's through a, an Eventbrite thing on your credit card or whatever to to pay for it. So, okay, did I talk about long enough? Is that good enough? It's going to be a really fun day, and um, I'm looking forward to it. And I hope uh, I hope you'll all buy tickets. Well, let's keep going back to the Ghost of the Sagebrush because Friday night we have our infamous in can raffle. And we know there's going to be a lot of good things there. Come in and do it because you get to put your little ticket in a tin can that's been around for just a few years. So come back and enjoy it. It's going to be a great fun night, great food, and outstanding atmosphere at the Mono Inn. It has been closed. It's just now starting to open up, and we're going to do it. We have a question over here. Um. Glenn Bunch from Hawthorne, just to add on to his story a little bit about the hydro plants. When, uh, before NV Energy Sierra Pacific took over the power company, it used to be Mineral County Power and Water. And at that time, the electricity for Hawthorne came from the generating plant here. That's why the power line goes all the way to Hawthorne along the highway. And for many a year, it was the backup power supply after we went to uh, NV Energy, Sierra Pacific. So it's, it, there was a whole lot more went with that. But, yeah, it, we used to get our power from there also. That's a great segue to bring it all out together here. So I'm going to turn it over to Dave to talk about tonight's great presentation. Dave, I'll tell you. Okay. Well, that is a great segue because our topic is um, the history of, of Walker Lake tonight and Walker Lake, Nevada. And uh, we have some folks that came over from Hawthorne, and we're really glad you're here tonight. Um, my name is Dave Carl, by the way. And uh, uh, last October, I had the pleasure of attending the annual Eastern Sierra uh, uh, history conference um, that was held uh, last year down at Saracosa College in, in Bishop. And at that, uh, one of the speakers, it, I, I've been mining <laughs> the, the most excellent speakers from the history conferences now for years and, and uh, mining them in the sense of inviting them to come up and, and uh, later on when they can uh, be part of our monthly speaker series here uh, for the Historical Society. So I would like to. Um, Welcome, um, Phil Gohan, who is a professor, and I'm going to put my glasses on, I will read better. Professor and chair of the Department of History at Cal State University, Stanislaw. He teaches environmental, Western, and California history. His research focuses on water issues in California and the Great Basin. His book, The Fall and Rise of the Wetlands of California's Great Central Valley, published by UC Press, University of California Press in 2011, analyzes the ecological transformation of the Central Valley from wetlands, riparian forests, and native grasslands to agriculture, as well as subsequent efforts to restore significant parts of the valley's natural habitat. He also completed an environmental history of the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta for the California Delta Protection Commission, and he's published articles on long-term drought and climate change in California and the ways in which climate change is affecting the management of U.S. public lands. His current project focuses on the ecological and human history of the terminal lakes, like Mono Lake and Walker Lake, of the Western Great Basin from the late Pleistocene epoch to the present. So would you all please join me in welcoming Dr. Garum.
Okay. Good evening, everyone. Pleasure to be here. I had brought a sports jacket, but I'm looking around the room and getting the general sense of the vibe and feeling overdressed with that. So if shirt sleeves are okay, we're gonna just uh, just go with that. Uh, all right, so is the microphone good placement? You can hear me all right? Terrific. Okay, so tonight I'd like to speak with you about some interesting developments at Walker Lake, a substantial remnant of Pleistocene or Ice Age Lake Lahontan in West Central Nevada located, as most of you know, only about a little over an hour from here. Lake Bono Lake, Walker Lake, is a terminal lake, also sometimes referred to as a terminus lake, which simply put means that it has no natural outlet. And like Bono Lake, it is an ancient lake that has survived through epochs of geological time, only to be threatened in recent times by diversion of the rivers that nourished it. As a result of these diversions, <laughs> um, hmm. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, like Mono Lake, Walker Lake was also on the verge of ecological collapse until very recent efforts to save and restore it. So that said, despite all of those similarities, the history of Walker Lake is quite different than that of Mono Lake. And it is that history I'd like to explore with you in this talk. Many have come to unofficially call the most recent period of human history the Anthropocene, referring to a time essentially since the Industrial Revolution, during which humans have had an outsized influence on every aspect of Earth's environment. My talk tonight will begin in the Pleistocene and take us to the Anthropocene. The Walker River, with its headquarters here in Mono County, high in the Sierra Nevada, is one of three substantial rivers, including the Carson and the Truckee, that flow from Eastern California into Western Nevada. But long before California and Nevada existed on a map, these rivers flowed into Pleistocene Lake Lahontan, the second largest of the enormous Ice Age lakes after Lake Bonneville in Western Utah that filled much of the Great Basin during the Pleistocene epoch. This geological period lasted from approximately 2.6 million years ago to about 11,700 years ago when the Holocene epoch in which we still live began. Toward the end of the Pleistocene, approximately 15,300 years ago, Lake Lahontan reached its last high stand, which is pictured here at approximately 4,370 feet above sea level. And it covered more than 8,000 square miles of what is now Western and Northwestern Nevada, almost 8% of the future state's total area. As we emerged out of the Pleistocene into the warmer and drier Holocene, Lake Lahontan contracted, and as lake levels dropped, separated into several remnant lakes. Next slide. Okay. okay. <laughs> no worries. Um, and these remnant lakes were distributed throughout the Lahontan Basin, including Pyramid Lake and Walker Lake. These ancient lakes have survived for tens of thousands of years, but during the past two centuries, they faced unprecedented threats as the rivers that supplied them were diverted for agriculture by the Euro-American settlers who entered the region in the mid-19th century. As the lakes diminished, native species were gradually extirpated, generating cascading ecological consequences and affecting the economy and livelihood of those who depended on those resources, especially their freshwater fisheries. Terminal lakes now face additional stressors from human-induced climate change. Yet, during the past few decades, efforts to preserve them have accelerated, one result of a profound change in how we value these ecosystems. A discussion of this history in terms of Walker Lake is particularly timely, I think, as Walker Lake is currently at an inflection point. Its nadir having been reached just a few years ago, institutions and funding mechanisms have now been established for the long-term restoration of the lake. The outcome, especially in the face of climate change, is uncertain, but the story is a hopeful one, and it points to a novel approach to bring together disparate stakeholders to ward off an environmental disaster. Next slide. 
It is from the late Pleistocene and early Holocene that a human and ecological history of this portion of the, West, of the Western Great Basin can be written. Some of the oldest archeological remains in Western North America are located around the edges of Pleistocene Lake Lahontan. Next slide. And around the wetlands that formed along the fringes of this lake as it receded during the Holocene. From rock shelters and caves, the latter formed by wave action from the lakes, there's well-documented evidence that this environment supported humans as well as native fish and other species from the earliest known occupation of the region. These lakes continued to support and sustain Native Americans, the Northern Paiute in particular, and in lesser numbers, the Western Shoshone peoples who resided in the Lahontan Basin and eventually drew the attention of the first Euro-American explorers to enter the Great Basin during the first half of the 19th century. The Walker River Paiutes refer to Walker Lake as Agepa, or trout water, in reference to the large Lahontan cutthroat trout that inhabited the lake and spawned upstream in the Walker River in large numbers until the early decades of the 20th century. Similarly, the Walker River Paiute tribe refers to itself as the Age de Cut, or trout eaters, reflecting the tribe's ancient connection to Walker Lake and the importance of the trout, which can grow to weigh 20 pounds or more as a principal source of their food. Now, to help visualize the locations within the Walker River Basin that we'll discuss today, I'd like to take a closer look at the geography of that basin, which encompasses 4,050 square miles. At its headwaters, high in Mono County, the river is divided into two forks. The West Walker River, the larger of the two forks, originates below Sonora Pass, and the main tributaries join near Sonora Junction on Highway 395. Flowing northward, the river flows past the small towns of Walker, Colville, and Topaz in the Antelope Valley, the only large agricultural area on the West Walker in California. This area marks the transition zone from the Sierra Nevada on the west to the Great Basin on the east. Straddling the California-Nevada border, Topaz Lake, an off-stream reservoir, created by the Walker River Irrigation District in 1921, is the only large storage reservoir on the West Walker. Below Topaz, the West Walker flows northeastward through the Smith and Mason Valleys, and these were the sites of the earliest agricultural settlement. Go back a slide. Earliest agricultural settlement along the river, in the Mason Valley, a few miles upstream from the city of Yarrington. The West Fork is joined by the East Fork. The East Fork, for its part, begins northeast of Yosemite National Park. The upper watershed tributaries coalesce in California's Bridgeport Valley. And like Antelope Valley on the West Walker, Bridgeport Valley is the only significant agricultural area on the East Walker in California. Bridgeport Dam and Reservoir, the only large reservoir on the East Walker, was constructed in 1924. Also by the Walker River Irrigation District. And crossing into Nevada, the East Walker flows through a sparsely populated landscape west of the substantial Wasik Range before joining the West Walker in the Mason Valley. The combined flow of these two forks then flows as the main stem Walker River, north past Yarrington before making a 180 degree turn near Wabuska. The Walker River then enters the Walker River Indian Reservation and flows into Weber Reservoir, constructed in 1934 by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, then through the main reservation town of Schurz, and from there into Walker Lake at the current southern border of the reservation. So I hope that rather detailed account would be helpful for visualizing all the places we'll talk about. All right, next slide, please. Now I've been naming the reservoirs constructed along the Walker River because the water stored in these reservoirs and diverted to support agriculture is water that no longer reaches and replenishes Walker Lake. The construction and operation of these reservoirs has had two profound effects. 
one affecting spawning migrations of Lahontan cutthroat trout, and the other affecting water quality in Walker Lake itself. The trout once migrated as far as 125 miles from Walker Lake into the Walker River system. Topaz Lake, with a controllable storage capacity of 60,000 acre feet, and Bridgeport Reservoir, with a storage capacity of 42,000 acre feet, locked spawning migrations into the upper reaches of the west and east forks of the Walker River, respectively. Much further downstream, the smaller Weber Reservoir, with an original storage capacity of only 13,000 acre feet, ended all migration of Lahontan cutthroat trout above that point, leaving only the poorly watered lower stretch of the river for the trout to attempt to spawn. Furthermore, the storage and diversion of water from the Walker River have been responsible for dramatic and rapid declines in the lake's volume and surface area, and for the increases in salinity that have brought Walker Lake to the ecological brink. By the end of the first decade of the century, the native fish species that inhabited the lake, including the Lahontan cutthroat trout, Tui Chub, and Tahoe sucker, had been extirpated. This collapse of fish populations, as well as of aquatic insects and plants, has in turn dramatically reduced the presence of migratory shorebirds, waterfowl, and other water birds that rely on these organisms for food, most notably the common loon and Western and Clark's grebe. The once popular annual loon festival, which drew tourist dollars into the local economy in and around Hawthorne, was canceled in 2009 on account of how few common loons were still using the lake as a stopover. After many thousands of years of persistence, this ecosystem has unraveled in less than two centuries after the first Euro-American explorers and fur trappers entered the region. American exploration of Lahontan Basin in general, and the Walker River Basin in particular, was part of the overall exploration of the Great Basin the vast area of internal drainage stretching from the eastern Sierra Nevada and Cascades to the west slope of the Rocky Mountains. Jedediah Smith appears to have been the first American explorer to encounter the Walker River and Walker Lake during his 1827 return journey from California to the Great Salt Lake, the first crossing of the Sierra Nevada from west to east by a white man. A transcript of Smith's original journals suggests that he crossed the West Walker and East Walker Rivers in late May of 1827 and reached Walker Lake on June 1st. Joseph Walker then explored the region in 1833 and again in 1834 as he trailblazed a route across Nevada along the Humboldt River to California, establishing part of what would become the California Trail. Walker served as chief guide for John C. Fremont's third expedition of the Corps of Topographical Engineers in 1845 which rendezvoused on the east shore of Walker Lake in late November of that year. And it was Fremont who named the Walker River and Walker Lake after his guide. The Journal of Edward Kern, the expedition's topographer and official artist, provides one of the earliest descriptions of the Walker River. Quote, a fine broad stream, 30 to 40 feet wide, with considerable current, timbered with fine large cottonwoods, its bottoms covered with a luxuriant growth of grass, wild peas, and rushes. In 1859, Captain J.H. Simpson, during his explorations for a direct wagon route westward from Salt Lake City to the base of the Sierra Nevada in Nevada's Carson Valley, encountered the Walker River during high water in late spring and described a much more powerful stream, quote, about 100 yards wide and from six to 10 feet deep. While camped along the river, Simpson reported that the Paiute Indians came into camp to sell or trade salmon trout, which we now know as the Lahontan cutthroat trout, weighing up to 20 pounds. He noted that the soil was a very rich dark loam and that, quote, the river bottom could be readily and copiously irrigated and made very productive. This last statement foreshadowed exactly what settlers along the Walker River were about to do, beginning in the Smith and Mason Valleys. In the late 1850s, American cattlemen arrived and settled the area, finding the low level land along the Walker River well suited for feeding and watering their livestock. In 1859, 
R.B. Smith and Timothy Smith arrived in the valley along the West Walker River that would come to bear the brother's name. And Nathan Hockett, or Hawk Mason, claimed the next valley downstream. Mason built up an operation, the Walker River Ranch, that spanned more than 20,000 acres. American settlement in the Walker River Basin would have significant consequences for the Paiute Indians who lived along both the Walker River and Walker Lake. In 1858, Frederick Dodge established an Indian agency in the Carson Valley, and in 1859 proposed two reservations for the Northern Paiute at Pyramid and Walker Lakes, respectively, and marked the boundaries for each. The U.S. General Land Office set the land for those reservations aside on December 8, 1859. The Walker River Reservation was surveyed in December 1864, the same year as Nevada statehood, and a decade later, an executive order by President Ulysses S. Grant formally established the reservation on March 19, 1874. Notably, in addition to approximately 319,000 acres of land, the Walker River Reservation originally included Walker Lake, as you can see on this slide. Right, which would later be stripped away. The federal government's goal with this reservation, as with so many others, was to turn Indians into farmers, and in the case of the Walker River Paiutes, not fishermen. From the beginning, however, the reservation faced constant threats of elimination, dating to at least 1877, when the Nevada State Legislature petitioned Congress to abandon the Walker River Reservation and open it up to white settlement. Railroads brought increased white settlement to the region as well. The Carson and Colorado Railroad, an offshoot of the Virginia and Truckee Railroad, or V&T, was incorporated in 1880 with the intention of serving silver mines at Candelaria and Bodie, as well as agricultural development in the Mason Valley. And it was built across the Walker River Reservation in 1880 and 1881. Henry M. Yarrington, superintendent of the V&T, became president of the Carson in Colorado. In exchange for receiving the right of way across the reservation, the railroad promised the Paiutes, quote, free transportation for themselves, their fish, game, etc. The issue of free passage was to prove a point of contention, as Yarrington reneged on that commitment as early as 1888. Serving as the railroad's attorney from that year, Senator William Stewart of Nevada worked tirelessly to eliminate the reservation in large part to extricate the Carson in Colorado from this commitment. Stewart's builds failed, but the reservation was ultimately reduced during the first years of the 20th century. In 1902, Congress made the reservation subject to allotment under the Dawes Act of 1887, and in 1906, the Walker River Paiute tribe had little choice but to cede 268,000 non-allotted acres of the reservation including all of the land around Walker Lake and the lake itself. As the political climate regarding Native Americans evolved during the 20th century, looking ahead a little bit here for a moment, congressional acts and presidential executive orders gradually restored to the reservation various segments that had been ceded. Most notably, 171,000 acres in 1936 during President Franklin Roosevelt's Indian New Deal. But Walker Lake itself has never been returned separated from their lake and fishery, and coerced into becoming agriculture dependent, the Walker River Reservation Paiutes suffered from inadequate water supplies to carry out that agriculture, a problem compounded by upstream diversions. Letters from various superintendents of the Walker River Agency repeatedly pointed out this problem, and indeed, the lack of reliable agricultural water supplies was the driving force behind the Walker River Paiutes' demands for storage reservation, a storage reservoir, excuse me, on the reservation, which in the 1930s would become Weber Reservoir. In 1882, while the Walker River Reservation was still in its formative stage, and while the Smith, Mason, Antelope, and Bridgeport Valleys were beginning to be developed, 
Israel Cook Russell of the U.S. Geological Survey carried out the first extensive study of the geology and hydrology of Ice Age Lake Lahontan and the contemporary lakes of Lahontan Basin, including Walker Lake. In his influential USGS monograph, Geological History of Lake Lahontan, Russell provided the first recorded measurement of the elevation of Walker Lake, 4,080 feet above mean sea level, sea level, and a maximum depth of 225 feet. Both figures turned out to be remarkably close to later calculations based on U.S. Navy bathymetric data. The lake at that time was 25.6 miles in length on a north-south axis, with an average width between four and a half and five miles. And it contained an estimated nine million acre feet of water. And I should probably mention an acre foot, in case anyone isn't familiar with that term, is approximately 326,000 gallons of water, or the amount of water it takes to cover, cover one acre of land one foot deep. Russell also measured the concentration of total dissolved solids, or TDS, which is a surrogate measure of salinity in freshwater systems, at approximately 2,560 milligrams per liter. Now, this, sh this slide shows the inverse relationship between the surface elevation of Walker Lake and the level of total dissolved solids plotted over time. Russell's measurements are important to the story of Walker Lake because they provide a baseline from which to measure subsequent declines in volume, which have amounted to 90.90%, and increases in the concentration of total dissolved solids, which have risen more than tenfold in recent years and have exceeded 28,000 milligrams per liter, well beyond the threshold that can support most fish and invertebrate species. It was this dramatic and protracted decline in water quality that would spur 21st century efforts to save the lake. Same slide. Back in 1919, farmers and ranchers in the Smith and Mason Valleys, along with other Walker River water users, formed the Walker River Irrigation District, or RID as it's pronounced, for the purpose of constructing Topaz and Bridgeport Reservoirs. In 1908, before the reservoirs were constructed, the USGS recorded the lake's level at 4,078 feet above sea level, only two feet lower than Israel Russell's estimate of a quarter century earlier, which indicated that small-scale irrigation diversions had not yet begun to take a serious toll on the lake. However, by 1925, with both reservoirs completed, nearly 100,000 acres within RID were under irrigation, and by 1928, Walker Lake's elevation had fallen to 4,052 feet, a decline of 26 vertical feet in the two decades since the 1908 measurement. By 1953, the year that Lahontan cutthroat trout began to be stocked annually in Walker Lake in an attempt to maintain the lake's freshwater fishery, the surface elevation had fallen to 3,988 feet, a 92-foot decline from Israel Russell's 1882 measurements, and the lake's volume had declined by more than half to only 4 million acre feet. The decline in volume, along with the corresponding rise in total dissolved solids, began to take a harsh toll on the lake's fish and wildlife. By 1994, the lake's volume fell to just over 2 million acre feet. TDS levels reached over 13,000 milligrams per liter, and the Tui Chub, major prey fish for Lahontan cutthroat trout, was in decline. Lahontan cutthroat trout, unlike most other trout species, can tolerate unusually high levels of salinity. But even with this high tolerance, at TDS levels above 14,000, they too begin to decline, and they do not survive at levels above 16,000 milligrams per liter. After 2006, Lahontan cutthroat trout were no longer stocked in the lake because of their low survival rates. And in 2009, the last stocked Lahontan cutthroat trout was fished out of the lake. By the early 1990s, it was clear that the lake was rapidly approaching this tipping point. And the severity of the decline in the Walker Lake ecosystem increasingly drew the attention of both local residents 
and Nevada politicians. In 1991, residents of Hawthorne, just to the south of Walker Lake, formed the Walker Lake Working Group, which has remained active and influential to the present day in its efforts to protect Walker Lake and restore its freshwater fishery. In addition to its lobbying efforts and extensive participation in negotiations and lawsuits over the future of the lake, the Walker Lake Working Group was directly responsible for the placement of elevation markers and signs on the road to Walker Lake Sportsman's Beach that show the exact elevation of the lake at selected years from 1882 through most of the 20th century making it obvious to visitors just how much has been lost. Meanwhile, the Walker River Basin and Walker Lake, along with the neighboring Truckee and Carson River Basins to the north, became a central issue for Nevada Senator Harry Reid. Full discussion of the interstate water controversy over the Truckee and Carson Rivers is really beyond our scope for today but it's relevant for understanding subsequent events in the Walker River Basin. So I wanna just touch on that briefly. Starting in the 1950s, California and Nevada entered into negotiations for interstate allocation of the waters of the Truckee, Carson, and Walker Rivers. The resulting California-Nevada Interstate Compact was ratified by California in 1970 and Nevada in 1971, but Congress never ratified that compact. It simply left too many issues, including Native American claims to water rights and environmental protections for fish and wildlife unresolved. Thus, when Harry Reid began his 20 year tenure as Senator in 1987, the issue was languishing. Yet within three years, Reid navigated an agreement over the Truckee and Carson rivers in the groundbreaking Truckee Carson Pyramid Lake Water Rights Settlement Act of 1990. Reed had decided to exclude the Walker River from these negotiations, however, because the situation in the Walker River Basin differed significantly from that of the Truckee and Carson Basins, most notably because there were no large federal irrigation projects in the Walker Basin. And Reed therefore believed the Walker required a different kind of solution. The evolution and current state of that solution will be the focus of the remainder of this presentation this evening. And as this legal and administrative history becomes quite complicated, I've provided an outline on the next few slides. Senator Reed deftly directed funding to Terminal Lakes in Nevada and most notably Walker Lake through a series of legislative acts, which political scientist Leo Wilds from the University of Nevada, Nevada Reno has aptly described as an iterative process. The process began with the 2002 Federal Farm Bill, which created and funded the Desert Terminal Lakes Program to be administered by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. The following year, the Omnibus Appropriations Bill of 2003 directed Desert Terminal Lakes Program funding to the three terminal lakes in northern Nevada, Walker Lake, Pyramid Lake, and the smaller Summit Lake contained within the Summit Lake Indian Reservation in the northwestern corner of the state. Significantly, these are the only three desert terminal lakes in North America that support a freshwater fishery. Unlike the 2002 Farm Bill, the 2003 Appropriations Bill did not prohibit the use of program funds to purchase water rights. And that opened an avenue for a water rights acquisition program in the Walker Basin for the benefit of Walker Lake. And this would prove ultimately to be of the utmost importance. The Energy and Water Development Appropriation Act of 2005, uh, I love presenting in haunted venues. Um, okay, so let's see, where were we? Um, 2005, right? The Energy and Water Development Auth Appropriation Act authorized and funded the Walker Basin Project, which was designed to sustain the basin's economy, ecosystem, and lake. The provisions of the 2005 Act were implemented collaboratively by the University of Nevada, Reno, 
and the Desert Research Institute of the Nevada System of Higher Education. The act required the Bureau of Reclamation to provide up to $70 million to UNR, 56 million of which was dedicated to acquiring land and water in the Walker River Basin, with the remaining 14 million used to undertake research, restoration, and educational activities in the basin. Research conducted by UNR and DRI scientists provided valuable tools and data to support lake restoration. But UNR proceeded cautiously concerning the acquisition of water rights. And the reason for this was largely on account of the widespread and at times fierce initial opposition to the water rights acquisition program by farmers and other stakeholders in Lyon County, which encompasses the Smith and Mason Valleys. However, in 2009, Congress passed Public Law 11185, legislation that designated the nonprofit National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the acronym of which is pronounced NIFWIF, to administer the acquisition program in place of UNR. NIFWIF would develop and implement the acquisition program through a new Walker Basin Restoration Program. Funding for this program would be provided once again through the Desert Terminal Lakes Program. And significantly, PL 11, 111.85 called for establishing, quote, a local nonprofit entity to hold and exercise water rights acquired by the Walker Basin Restoration Program. In 2014, it was this authorization that led NIFWIF to create the Walker Basin Conservancy. And a few years later, in 2017, at NIFWIF's initiative, the Walker Basin Conservancy took over responsibility for the full suite of NIFWF's former responsibilities in the basin. By the time Senator Reid left office that same year, 2017, he had successfully appropriated a total of $525 million in USDA funding for the Desert Terminal Lakes Program, a sizable portion of which was dedicated toward the restoration of Walker Lake. This accomplishment is no small part of his legacy and may have come just in time. In February 2017, Walker Lake had reached its historic low point, 3,906 feet of surface elevation, a decline of more than 170 vertical feet since Israel Cook's 1882 measurement, and a volume of approximately 910,000 acre feet. Remember, it had originally been 9 million. Today, the Walker Basin Conservancy one more, is the main agent and driving force behind restoration efforts for the basin and lake and works closely with stakeholders in Lyon County, as well as with the Walker River Paiute tribe. The core of the Conservancy's efforts to restore Walker Lake is the Water Rights Acquisition Program, which includes the purchase of privately held water rights from willing sellers, as well as a water leasing program for water that would otherwise be stored in the basin's reservoirs. Once willing sellers have negotiated the sale of their water rights, a complex legal process must be completed to change the water rights from their original irrigation use to in-stream use in order for that water to be permitted to reach Walker Lake. This process entails modifying the so-called Walker River degree the 1939 adjudication of the water rights of nearly the entire Walker Basin, including those of the Walker River Reservation. First, the Walker Basin Conservancy must submit a formal application to the Office of the Nevada State Engineer, which has authority over water rights in the state. Then, because the Walker River is an interstate river system, the Federal District Court for Nevada, also known as the Degree Court, must complete its own process for modifying the Walker River decree. On April 16th, 2019, the district court formally modified the Walker River degree to allow for the first water rights purchase concluded way back in 2010 to be protected in stream for the benefit of Walker Lake. And on July 5th, 2019, this became the first acquired water to flow into the lake, totaling more than 300 acre feet. So that's the last of the slide with lots of words on them, but now we have a complicated graph. <laughs> the Walker Basin Conservancy has set a long-term goal for restoring the biological integrity of Walker Lake by raising the lake level. 
This table shows the optimal and borderline TDS levels for the survival of a range of invertebrates, fish, and water bird indicator species. The target lake elevation levels have been determined by this data. And the primary target is to raise the lake level to 3,951 acre feet, at which elevation the volume of water in Walker Lake would more than double to 2.3 million acre feet, and TDS levels would decline to 12,000 milligrams per liter. Key native fish species, including the Lahontan cutthroat trout and Tui chub, would be able to survive and reproduce as would most aquatic invertebrates. And there would be adequate food for the common loon and Western and Clark's grebes to return. Through the processes I've just described, the Walker Basin Conservancy has already acquired water rights to 53% of the estimated annual 50,000 acre feet of water annually necessary to reach this goal. Now this slide is a recent version of the kind of graph we discussed earlier. And it demonstrates some promising signs. Runoff from the extremely heavy snowpack of the winter of 22-23 has already significantly raised the surface elevation of Walker Lake and reduced the TDS levels. As of one week ago, even slightly more recently than this graph, the lake level had exceeded 3,922 feet, 15 feet higher than its most recent low point in January. <laughs> It's a good thing. This raised lake level translates to a lake volume of 1.37 million acre feet, more than a 40% increase since January. And when TDS levels were last measured in mid-July, just under a month ago, that level had fallen to 20,700 milligrams per liter, a number not seen in a decade. Now, there are a couple of lessons to be drawn from this graph. Extremely wet winters like this past one, and before that, the winter in, of 2017, which also see a spike there, can substantially raise lake levels and reduce TDS. Historically, however, when dry years return, the effects of all the upstream irrigation diversions are quite noticeable and the lake declines sharply. What has changed in this water balance is that as we have seen in the past few years, the Walker Basin Conservancy has been purchasing water rights and allowing some of that former irrigation water to flow into the lake. Over time, this should mean that in wet years, when lake levels rise naturally, they will rise even more so because of the additional acquired water. And in dry years, when the lake would typically decline significantly, this newly acquired water will either negate that decline or at the least minimize its extent. So thus, the water rights acquisition program is intended to move the lake toward its target surface elevation and TDS levels over time. In addition to the substantial progress made with the acquisition of water rights to restore Walker Lake, the Walker Basin Conservancy has been operating successfully on multiple fronts in the Walker River Basin. Having acquired and donated to the state of Nevada more than 12,000 acres of land and nearly 30 miles of the East Walker River Corridor to establish the Walker River State Recreation Area, dedicated in 2018 for fishing, hunting, and other recreational opportunities, including rafting and swimming. It's a beautiful place. I recommend a visit. For its part, the Walker River Paiute Tribe has also been actively engaged in the current struggle to save Walker Lake. In addition to fighting for their own water rights, they've joined with other supporters of Walker Lake, including Mineral County, which contains Walker Lake, the Walker Lake Working Group, and the federal government, and they've been making a public trust doctrine argument in court. The public trust doctrine, doctrine the legal principle that the state is responsible for protecting natural and cultural resources for the use and enjoyment of the people is of course the same doctrine that led to the protection of Mono Lake. And although the Nevada State Supreme Court has ruled that the public trust doctrine, while it applies, cannot be used to reallocate already adjudicated water rights, in other words, the water rights of the farmers and ranchers in the Walker Basin, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in 2021 that other remedies short of that are permissible. And the Federal District Court for Nevada is currently reviewing 
those possible remedies. Although it is not yet apparent exactly how these legal challenges will be decided, Walker Lake appears to be at the cusp of recovery, which makes this an encouraging environmental history story. But as with almost all questions of environmental restoration, climate change in the Anthropocene poses the greatest threat to continued progress. As human-induced climate change accelerates, as temperatures continue to rise, droughts intensify, and evaporation increases, the as yet unanswered questions are if there will remain enough water to purchase to continue to restore the lake, and how much of that purchased water will make it all the way downstream to the lake before being absorbed or evaporated. That story will unfold over the coming decades, but for now, the restoration efforts on behalf of Walker Lake and the Walker River Basin by all of the groups and entities and individuals that we've talked about tonight point to a remarkable shift in cultural values and priorities from agricultural development at all costs to the importance of protecting native species and the ancient lakes that have supported humans and non-human species since the Pleistocene. And I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, oh, before we have, start, for questions. those of you keeping score at home, this is Rich Foy. What happened five minutes into Phil's speech was my computer recognized that it had never been plugged in. I certainly thought it had been plugged in. And computers having a malevolent sense of humor that they do, it uh, turned itself off. What was that? Five minutes into Phil's speech. But okay. thank you for soldiering on. <laughs> while the wheels came off the bus. <laughs> no problem whatsoever. Is the Israel Russell report available? We have his section that pertains to Mona Lake here that many people in this room have read. Oh, yes, yes, that's publicly available. It's a government document. So wonderful. Questions? But the people at home listen at you. Hello, everybody. I'm Marlene Bunch, and I'm with Walker Lake Working Group. And, uh, yeah, there are some brochures over here. And if you're so inclined to help us, we're the, the stronghold in the public trust doctrine. And we are in the, the final years of it. Um, Senator Reed, bless his heart, gave us a lot of funds to get us to where we're at, but those funds are no longer available. So if you can see in your heart. Indeed. Glenn Bunch with the working group. One other thing that uh, happened in the past and happened tonight is uh, <clears throat> we were in a meeting, uh, we, Marlene was in a meeting with the newspaper at the newspaper office in Hawthorne. And uh, she was in a pretty heated discussion with one of the people from upstream from uh, the Mason Valley. And as it was coming to an end of the heated discussion, one of the fan blades came off of the fan, ceiling fan, and it ran around the room and fell down and that ended the meeting. And so it was put out there that that you know this this was a coincidence or was it well another spinoff of that was in his talk tonight where he was talking about it we had a big gust of wind come through <laughs> so it's the man is watching <laughs> the 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 words that i said at that time as they were saying well the lake dried up two thousand two years ago and it's just going to dry up again we shouldn't have to spend all these these funds in in saving the lake and i says yeah but god brought it back those times this time man is dying is is drying it up and man has to put it back and the blade fell landed on the desk they said oh my word and <laughs> well, we, we were kind of at that spot tonight when the gust of wind came through and rattled the tiles so <laughs> 
there there is an almighty purpose up uh, up above and and he's guided us through a lot of bumps through our our years but we're in those final final stages and if you can spare a few bucks we can sure use it and like i said it's in the brochure there's a a return mailer in the in the back of it yes sure come see me <laughs> And and it, I'll turn it up back to Phil. For I have a question for him too. But for your group, what's the size of the membership of your group? And do you have meetings, sort of like this, uh, on a, any sort of a schedule? Um, we meet every month, and in the in the early years of this. Now we formed in November 1991, and. Um, and I was there that day, and I've been there every meeting ever since. We've never missed a month in all those years. In some of those months, we were having two meetings a month. But um, recently, we've been able to cover it all in, in one meeting a month. And it's tomorrow at 2 o'clock. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, my, ma my, my group itself goes over a hundred and so they they're scattered all over the united states um in fact i just received a nice 500 hundred dollar donation last week from a, one in georgia so it i mean it the the success of saving walker lake on the legal side is you know walker basin conservancy is amazing we've seen them from the conception of the nifwif all the way through we've supported it all the way through in fact they come to our meetings too i saw a cat on the screen earlier and i said up oh, she's listening so um but yeah it's it's a partnership to get this job done and it can only be done with everybody pitching in to help and i just one more thing the well one of the questions <laughs> that, that was asked is how many well, what 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 do we have when we have our meetings, we have participation of people walking in the door and sitting down personally in the meetings vary from 10 to 25. But um, as far as other history out there, we have members that are from all over, a whole lot like you guys have with the Mona Group. Yes. Okay, okay, I just wanna plug one thing, September 23rd. We're having a rehydration celebration at Monument Beach and um, starting about nine o'clock in the morning. It says eight on there, but I think it's gonna be more like nine. My body doesn't move that fast. And and we've we've got speakers that's gonna be coming in. Gary Nelson is bringing the, the canoes over. It's gonna be an absolutely fun day. So take a flyer, take take a brochure, and pray a little bit for Walker Lake. And, and thank you guys so, so let me ask you, Phil, this is your talk, um, but uh, how did you get, um, how did you get interested in this and how did you, you were telling me before we started that how these folks have helped you with some of the, the work you've done, so. Okay. You're on, you're on the mic. I'd be happy to address that, David, I will in just a minute. I would first, if you don't mind, I'd like to touch on something that um, Glenn and Marlene said. Um, first of all, I want to thank the two of them for letting me hang out in their living room for a couple of days last summer, looking through all the working groups' files, which was wonderful. Mm -hmm. But they also mentioned, uh, Marlene mentioned that um, in the past, Walker Lake um, has dried up. And I left that out of the talk in the interest of time tonight, but I thought it was worth saying a couple of words about that. When I was showing you that map of the Walker um, River Basin, and we were looking at the place where the river took a 180 degree turn, and I mentioned it was near this um, hamlet of Wabuska, there is an ancient paleo channel there where apparently the Walker River maybe twice in the last 5,000 years has changed course and flowed through something called the Adrian Valley into the Carson Basin. And when that happened, Walker Lake apparently either partially or completely dried up. Um, but it returned to its natural channel um, 
by natural processes. And of course, that kind of lake desiccation is different from the lake being dried up because we're diverting all the water elsewhere for agriculture. So I did want to touch on that. Um, as to how I got interested in this, um, it's a really long story, but I'll try to make it short. Um, so when I write environmental histories, I like to bring three elements into it, three things that I'm very interested in. Environmental history, um, environmental law and water law, and ecology. And after I finished my first book on California wetlands, I was looking for a subject um, on the east side of the Sierra. I wanted to move beyond California, become a little bit more of a Western historian as well. And um, it just so happened that a very good friend of mine from graduate school, who's a limnologist, um, a lake ecologist, had been working on these terminal lakes for a number of years. And um, at my wedding, we were talking about how no historian has ever written this story. And we started bouncing some ideas around. And I decided that this would be a wonderful topic for um, my next book. So um, I find the environment out here, the ecosystem, the high desert, a fascinating place. I love this area. I've spent time on the east side of the Sierra for decades now and, um, and in western Nevada. And it just seemed like the absolute perfect topic, and it seemed like just the right time to do it because things seem to be reaching a turning point. So, um, so much of books that get written, um, it's a little bit of serendipity. You know, it's, you're in the right place at the right time. Maybe somebody pops an idea into your head that matches very closely with ways that you had been thinking. And in a nutshell, that's how I came to it. Well, that's the other thing. Uh, <laughs> The question was, when's the book coming out? Yeah, no, I heard that loud and clear. Um, okay. Um, it takes a very long time to write a history book. And um, I teach in this California State University system, and we have a rather high teaching load there. So that makes it take even longer, because um, you don't really have any time to do any research except during summers. So within the decade, <laughs> you know, my first book took 14 years from inception to publication. So this one I've been researching for about a half a dozen years now so far. So it'll be a little ways yet. There will be articles published along the way in various academic journals. So some of this will come out and be available. But as far as an actual full length book, that's, um, that's still a ways away. Oh, zooming in. Yeah. So, so Philip, would you will you be including Summit Lake in your book as well? Some Summit Lake. At the moment, I'm thinking about that. Yes. The question is, at this point. Okay, so there's aspirations and there's time, right? Initially, initially, I thought I could write a book about the terminal lakes of the entire Great Basin, and then I remembered where I taught, and I thought, no, I'm not going to have time for that. Um, I love my university, by the way. But um, so then I thought, well, maybe I could narrow it down a little bit to the Western Great Basin. And then I thought, well, maybe just the Lahontan Basin, right? And so if I do the Lahontan Basin, it would be Walker and Pyramid and Summit. Um, Walker Lake itself can almost be a book. Sure. So I really haven't ultimately decided just what the scope would be. Um, but I would certainly talk about Summit, even if I didn't treat it in tremendous detail. That remains to be seen. Well, the microphone's in the neighborhood. Um, so how many more feet rise? You told us it's already come up 15 or so. How many more feet rise would it take to get to this, uh, the aspirational level? Well, let's see, let's, let's do the math. It was down to about 3907. It went up 15 to 3922. The goal is 3951, so just shy of 30 more feet. So we need two more winters like this last one. A couple more winters would help, complemented, of course, by all these water purchases. Well, thanks very much. Um, thanks also to the Walker Lake Working Group for what you've done for so long. It's amazing. And you continue to do it, so thank you. So my question, when you talked about the re- not the re-adjudication, but the um, rededication of water rights. You focused on Nevada. The 
East and West Walker River also flow through Mono County in California. So is there a rededication process for water rights on this side of the border or did Harry Reid's legislation restrict his funding to the state of Nevada? That's an excellent question. My understanding is that originally it was limited to the state of Nevada. However, um, when I was doing some research at the Walker Basin Conservancy last summer, we seem to be reaching the point where now we're going to be able to address some of those water users in California as well. And I think that's been a fairly recent development. I don't have the specific details of how far we've gone on that yet, but it does seem that that is going to be a possibility as far as I know. When the Conservancy started, they were focusing mainly in the Wabasca area because there they had a lot of research. Every parcel of acre foot of water that was purchased went through rigorous um, testing on the paper, where it's at, how much will it get there, how much will lose the whole works, and who is below the water right that is purchased. And if we purchase this water right in point A, will B, C, D, and E benefit and, and, and possibly use that water right that's been released at parcel A? So there's a lot of mythology that goes into it. I praise the Conservancy and their crew. They have the the technology that so that when a water right is purchased, they know that it's going to come to the lake by what degree. And they've worked in a lot of, of agreements to get everybody on board, including the irrigation district. So um, uh, they're they're just a marvelous group, and it's it's a twofold thing. They're working on obtaining the water rights. We're t working on the legal side to protect those water rights. So it's it's a very complex deal. I could sit here and talk all night, but you really don't want it. <laughs> what else? I have a question about the cutthroat trout and with their, with all the blockages, with all the damming that's gone on, it would actually help to restore cutthroat trout fisheries throughout the Sierras if somehow the dams, you know, if there was some way to do that, would that improve that, the cutthroat trout also all the way up since they're kind of now limited to the Walker Lake area uh -huh. when they're just being restored there? No, absolutely. Absolutely. Great, great question. Great point. Um, about a decade ago, um, Weber Dam um, was reconstructed and they put in um, an up uh, kind of state of the art fish ladder and all of that. Um, so now it would be possible for um, fish to make it past Weber Reservoir. Unfortunately, by the time that had happened, the trout were gone. Right. But, but if they are restored, they would now be able to make it um, past Weber and into the upper stretches of the river, at least as far as Bridgeport and Topaz Reservoirs. Kind of a one bunch with Mineral County, a Walker Lake Working Group. Another, yeah, the other hat. Um, one of the things that's kind of answering your question is the Department of Wildlife has started planting cutthroat trout in the upper tributaries and the streams up above and in some of the areas so that hopefully someday we'll be able to to have them. Um, theoretically, they first planted the first uh, batch of them in Cottonwood Canyon above Walker Lake, but since then they have been putting strains of uh, cutthroat trout in other streams and tributaries in the state of Nevada. So, yes, they're working on it, but thank you. 
Thank you for that one. So um, it's about um, that time that we, we promise people will we'll wrap it up. We want to, oh, we have a series of questions online. <laughs> Now, n normally I would turn this over to Dave Swisher, but I, you may wonder what happened to our president. Um, he had a family family emergency. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we get past the, the glitches here. Where's the first real question? Uh, uh, Dr. Garon, thank you for um, an excellent talk with details about the human, including policy history affecting Walker Lake. For more information about the Walker Basin Conservancy, People can go to the www.walkerbasin.org. I should okay. just briefly say, um, yes, Dr. Chandra there, Sudeep Chandra, is the person who gave me that inspiration that I was sharing uh, with you all earlier. All right. Okay. And, so, and I mentioned that he gave me that inspiration talking at my wedding, which was here at Mono Lake, by the way. So we've got several great jobs. Great job, Glenn and Marlene and Dr. Graham. Um, Tim Messick is asking about the Wilderness the Wilderness Conservancy is acquiring some lands and water rights in Mono County on the West Walker. Um, is this a question? A diversion canal around as using the old riverbed? Is that a, I guess that's a, is that a feasible idea? Don't know that I can answer that right now. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> the question on that, I, I I can help a whole lot with that. Um, it was in the, I want to say, the late '90s, maybe, yeah. And there was a a water problem, and the irrigation district drained Bridgeport, and when they did, they sanded. The riverbed, uh, the state of California got involved with it and said, you'll clean this up. And at that time, we done a tour. And one of the things that was brought up at that time was the irrigation district was wanting to dewater the old riverbed that bypasses Topaz because the only thing that was in that was carp, uh, a warm water fish. The state of California, as well as the Department of Wildlife, said no, there will be water in that year round to keep the fish alive in the old bed. So the water is going both ways. It goes into Topaz, but there is an amount of it that stays in the, in the bypass. Okay? Sounds, uh, people who are familiar with the Mona Lake story recognize that uh, there's state California state law that says you cannot... When you divert water from streams, you cannot completely dewater them. You have to keep enough there to keep the fishery, the, the health of the stream. So, yes. Okay, wait a minute. About it. What did you want me to say, Rich, about oh, this? Well, there's a, a web, um, wildlandconservancy.org slash regions slash Eastern Sierra Nevada is another website from Tim Messick. So, Lynn. And then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up, and, and I think we'll let people do individual questions with, um, with Phil um, so that people, some people need to go. Yeah, I was just going to say that Trout Unlimited and probably with Endow and, and other agencies are working with, they've been testing Rough Creek to determine whether it is going to be a viable um, uh, nursery for Lahat and cutthroat trout. So Rough Creek coming out of the Bodie Hills and down into, it It actually flows into the East Walker River, um, goes through the Conservancy, Walker Basin Conservancy area. Um, so that's one of the little future plantings of, of Lahat and cutthroat trout. Thank you for that. If we find the thoughts, uh, should we wrap it up? Phil, do you have anything you really want to say? No, I, I think fairly adequately addressed folks' questions, and I don't think I have anything. This has been fantastic, and I want to thank you again, everyone. We've got a long way to do this, and we appreciate that too. And um, we have so obviously some cleanup to do and things in the kitchen and putting chairs and tables away. But 
Well, you can stay here for a bit, and if people want to come and talk, um, don't forget that there's some handouts over here on the table by the front door, too, for the Walker River Group.